Okay, well, you know I like covering overlooked weapons and going ridiculously deep on said subject. This is definitely one of those videos. And you're looking at a uh, formerly famous comedian Gallagher. Stand-up was actually pretty good. Uh, he's misunderstood, but that's besides the point. His shtick was smashing things with a giant wooden mallet. And mallet is a correct word, maybe not the correct word. It's definitely correct. You can use it for this kind of a thing. Here's mine, uh, but I much prefer maul. I think it's more correct in a weaponry context within weaponry circles. And anyway, I did not make this, thankfully. It'd look really horrible if I did it. I bought this at a renaissance fair. I'll have links to the maker in the video description. But first, let's get to the important part, playing. This thing is really, really fun. And it fits my Forgotten Impact weapon series like a glove, because these got used a lot more than you would think. And when I say these, of course, I mean this kind of thing. A wooden mallet, or maul, one-handed, two-handed, that kind of thing, wooden hammers, in other words, was very handy and used throughout much of our history and later than you'd think. For instance, Abraham Lincoln, of course, lived in the 19th century. And he owned and used this one right here. And long, long before him, in kind of a primitive context, if you will, people realized, oh yeah, you can shape wood to make a big basher like this. No metallurgy skills or resources required. And this website here, Simon's Discoveries, is correct when it says, quote, We're used to calling the period occurring after the Bronze Age the Iron Age. Some peoples managed to produce iron tools well over 3,000 years ago, but whilst iron was already in use and in some cases was almost indispensable, it wasn't cheap and accessible for a very long time, period. Visual-wise, we're switching to one of many videos about how to make these, and notice that it has a different shape. But uh, back to the Simon's Discoveries site, they have a handy historical reference here. It's about a traveler who was in rural Poland in the 17th century, and he wrote in his diary about how it seemed like everything the peasants used was made out of wood. They had a few steel tools, iron tools, axes, knives, that kind of thing, but not very many, and meanwhile, it just seemed like everything from, quote, houses to tools to shoes and clothes was made from plant material, end quote. He also mentions a Polish ethnographer that described the peoples of Northeast Europe, the rural folks, as basically living in a wood age, you know, but we don't think about that. And even after the unofficial wood age ended, of course, there's a ton of overlap here, but even after it did, you still had people like Old Abe using things like this or this. So these are not purpose-built weapons at all. But if human history has taught us anything, it's that if people get into a fight and they have access to something that was designed for hitting, they're going to use it that way. Turning a peaceful tool into an improvised weapon. Now, as you can see, I've been showing some one-headed models, but our focus today is what I would call the mall, and that, by definition, my definition, is a two-handed large wooden hammer. And what the heck, I'm a court-recognized impact weapons expert now, so I'm going to go with my definition. And the kind of improvised weapon we're talking about today was a very common tool, and for thousands of years. Notice, unlike some of the other ones from earlier in the video, this one here has this metal rim around the edge of the striking portion. When available, that was an enhancement that helped it last longer. You know, if you're going to use this thing to pound stakes into the ground and that kind of a thing repeatedly, and you could get a blacksmith to do this for you, well then why wouldn't you? And again, this takes just a fraction of the metal that creating a, a sledgehammer, you know, a metal sledgehammer would. I know this is not a very clear picture coming up, but it serves a great purpose. Notice how in this storybook, this old storybook illustration, we see our instrument right there because it was a very common instrument. Uh, it would have been used in this context, forget about the bear for a second, uh, to pound wedges into that split log. And this is a worldwide phenomenon, as we see here in this Japanese drawing. We've got a yokai wielding one, and clearly wielding it as a weapon, not as a tool. And at least according to illustrations, which we have to be careful about trusting, even samurai could use something like this. And how amazing does that one on the right look? Here's another one. So yeah, there's going to be need in a lot of different cultures for something like this. And again, 
we think of the Bronze Age, the Iron Age, etc., but a lot of times the simpler method is going to be to make your tool out of wood. And regarding the point that we have to be careful about trusting old illustrations, notice that the axe you're going to see at the bottom right is impossibly large. And yet it seems imminently practical compared to this grappling hook. It's still a marvelous illustration, but yeah, good luck carrying and using that thing. However, the samurai mall, known as an atsuchi, was basically used as seen here in our latest image. This is for breaking down doors and gates. And people have made modern recreations. You can buy one. I definitely have that on my wish list at some point. I need something like this just to play with. The one I bought, which I showed at the start of the video, which caused this whole video to be made, is a ton of fun to play with and really to work out with. And if I do upgrade on size, I already know which one I want. This one right here from Japan, not made as a Japanese weapons recreation. It's an agricultural tool. But again, these things were tools more than weapons. And yeah, check this out. Made by a family that's been doing this for centuries. Because, you know, of course, it's Japan. And speaking of how it really is a functional tool, it's one that still gets used today. Here's an interesting one, kind of asymmetrical. And there it is. In action. And so someone who does that all day long or anything similar, you know, throughout the ages, would probably be pretty decent at swinging this thing with ill intent. But let's get back to the Western world, because they had something Japan really didn't, which is dedicated war hammers. And a war hammer, a hammer actually meant for war, and for using against a heavily armored opponent, looked nothing like our tool, as you can see here. Or here. And obviously it's not just that these are metal, but they're only so heavy. As the saying goes in football, speed kills. And that's why these never look like the fantasy equivalents. Look how slender this thing is. And it only weighs two and a half pounds, which I would say is pretty typical. Obviously a two-handed model, like the kind we reviewed a second ago, or as seen here, is going to weigh more, but still. It's a far, far cry from a fantasy version like this. Although this does look really, really cool. It's from a comic book, as you'll see. And as insanely large as that is, it's closer, I would say, to the popular imagination's version of what an actual Warhammer is than the real thing. And speaking of comic books, female characters, and two-handed hammers, Harley Quinn would be the most famous example. And hers harkens back to a real thing, an actual descendant of what we're talking about in this episode. This is the carnival mallet. I'm using the word mallet because that's what it's commonly referred to as. But yeah, this was used in feat of strength carnival games for generations. Probably also used it to pound ten stakes into the ground as a roving carnival was being set up, things like that. And I'd bet just about anything that a carny brawl or more than one was settled with one of these at some point. But speaking of the cartoonishly large version that exists in the popular imagination, as in our last comic book image and this one as well, look at the size of this thing. When we talk about that, we have to talk about this. You're looking at a modern recreation made for sale of a fantasy weapon from a fantasy movie, and I wonder how many of you recognize this. Well, here's where it's from. That's, of course, a clip from Conan the Barbarian, the original, and one of the greatest fantasy movies of all time. Thorgrim was the character's name, played by Sven Ole Thorsen, a Danish actor, bodybuilder, stuntman, strongman, competitor, etc. And as a kid in the 80s watching this on cable, I thought this was pretty much the coolest thing I'd ever seen. And except for the point, the carved point, you can see this is actually much closer to a historical mall. The thing is, no, there were not generally all wooden or almost all wooden battle malls. Um, but if they did, uh, that point would actually not be a good idea, in my opinion. Not with something that has a striking surface that wide. Because if you miss your target by even a little bit, 
it's going to encourage the mall, the hammer, to just glance off of the target. Now, in reality, in history, where there are bare-chested big dudes swinging two-handed wooden impact weapons, yeah, like this guy, a Celt. And from much later in history, here's fight manual evidence that the practice was not just restricted to Roman times. What you'll notice, of course, in both images is that the weapon looks nothing like a giant wooden hammer. And realistically, even this kind of thing here was a real historical rarity. Why? Because, like we said, speed kills. Think about all of the predominant stick fighting traditions from around the world. It's usually a much thinner stick. Or, if it is thick, it's a much, much shorter and one-handed. But that doesn't mean this thing does not have a very long pedigree. How long? How about 5,500 years? From LiveScience.com, you are looking at a recreation of a prehistoric two-handed wooden top-heavy impact weapon. And of course, it's not shaped like a mall, but it's also not shaped like a simple club and definitely not like a rod-like staff. And here is the real thing, or what's left of it. Now, in my opinion, a spear, even a simple wooden spear with no stone tip, much less metal, just a simple wooden spear is a much better weapon than what we're looking at. But this would do the job if you hit somebody with it, that's for sure, this fat cricket bat. But how did something like this come about? Well, I would guess, probably, because of what we talked about much earlier in the video, things like this. You have something like this deep in prehistory, you're fighting, and you realize, well, what if I slim this thing down a little bit? It's quicker in battle, it strikes with a reduced striking surface, and now I'm making a dedicated weapon instead of using a multi-purpose tool as a weapon. And of course, later on, deep in history, but later on, stone maces, things like that are built, but I think this is the start of what led to the real and fantasy Warhammers. It's why, ultimately, a god like Thor wields a hammer. And quick aside, elsewhere on my channel, in the shorts section, you can see the actual MCU Chris Hemsworth film-used hammer, Mohilner, that I got to hold. But back to my original train of thought, it's why a god like Hercules wields a big wooden club. And that is how... The imagination created characters wielding this kind of thing. And these do look awesome. That's why fantasy illustrators cannot get enough of it. But, of course, the reality, if it comes to a weapon, quote-unquote weapon, that looks like this, it was actually one of these. And it was a tool that you were using in a fight because it was handy. Rare as that kind of a thing being used in a fight is, do we have some martial artists preserving or preserving slash inventing techniques for a tool like this? Yes, we do. There's a smattering on YouTube. I can't say I'm terribly impressed with the techniques I've seen. They do not look realistic. But since they were used on occasion, the question remains, how effective would they be? Well, here's one Tonight, bit of evidence. A soldier initiation caught on tape. This disturbing video was taken at a North Carolina base earlier this year, and tonight the soldier's father is calling for the man who hit... That army sergeant immediately collapsed after the clip ends that I just showed you, collapses, hits the floor, and has a seizure. And the man hitting him is a complete idiot who seems to know absolutely nothing about impact weapons and anatomy. And I would think whatever level of unarmed combat training and hand-to-hand... -hand training that you receive uh, would at least get you to understand that that was extremely dangerous. Hit him on the butt, hit him on the thigh, something, I'm not saying the hazing should exist like that, but if you're going to do something like that, yeah. But were these kinds of things ever used in battle? So something besides kind of a one-on-one -on -one scuffle where the farmer or the carnival worker or whoever snatches this up because there it is. Yes, but before we get to that, let's deal with something that's somewhere in between those two extremes. You're looking at an ancient illustration of what was called, in translation, the Mallet Uprising. And this was in Paris, France. I'm going to quote from Britannica here, quote, In 1382, a tax riot grew into a revolt called the Mallet Uprising. The rioters, armed with mauls, 
were ruthlessly put down and the municipal function was suspended for the next 79 years. If you go to look up this revolt, uh, the uprising, here's how it's spelled, M-A-I-L-L-O-T-I-N. So, medieval Paris, you had a guild or guilds who used that tool, and then when they revolted, it became the signature weapon. Just to deep dive and geek out even further, I'm pretty sure, I think we can assume, those malls that you saw in that image, in that illustration, they would have had their striking heads covered in a layer of lead. And even so, I think the instrument definitely counts for our purposes. It's not an iron skin or steel that was given to it. Lead is malleable, right? So you still have the large wooden mall with a striking head that's basically soft, at least soft compared to like a steel warhammer's head. And I assume that the head would get worn out and deformed just like the all wooden models. Just maybe take a little bit more time, last a little bit longer, before needing repairs or replacement. And of course it gives it extra mass for the swinging. Why are we looking at a illustration of Solomon's Temple? Well, just so I can read this quotation. Let's do a little interstitial before we get to our next fight. Quote, we have excellent authority, however, for one exception. For we are told that at the building of King Solomon's temple, the stones were set in place by wooden setting malls. End quote. So, to set a stone in place. Just again to touch on how ancient this arrangement is. And now for a formal battle, as opposed to the revolt we dealt with a second ago. This happened on October 25th, 1415, one of the most famous battles in Western history. The Battle of Agincourt, where famously French knights, seen here on the right, were defeated as they charged English bowmen on the left. And you'll notice they've got their bows, and see those stakes in the ground, meant to protect them from the charging cavalry. Very important, or those heavily armored knights are just going to run you down. Well, how do you think those stakes got put into the ground? Quote, those handles projecting from both men's backs belong to the malls to which archers resorted when their arrows were gone. End quote. That's from Weapons, A Pictorial History. So yes, malls were put to good use in the Battle of Agincourt. You've expended all your arrows, famously the French knights got stuck in the mud, essentially, as they were trying to charge, and now you need to run up and finish them off. Well, if you have a giant maul strapped to your back, you're going to unsling that thing and use it. Of course, some of the English had other weapons too. I'm not saying every single one that charged and uh, engaged in melee combat with the knights was holding a maul. They had swords and axes, but still, a prominent part for our instrument in the battle that many say ended the Age of Chivalry. And back to the purchase that inspired this whole video. I think I forgot to mention the haft here is hickory, very strong wood, and the head is ash. But of course, it's more of a showpiece. It's not for you know, pounding stakes into the ground, really. I mentioned at the start of the video how it's a fun item, and yeah, if you're a weapons geek, something like this is a real change-up from a lot of the other sticks and beaters that you have in your collection. It's also great to work out with. I know it doesn't look like it's super heavy, but it's much heavier than it looks. A lot of you might look at this picture and think of a certain shalala type, like the one over on the left, the hammer-headed one, third or fourth, depending on how you want to count. But those tend to be small, like the one in this picture, so it's really not a mall. Mine, again, going back to it, being much heavier than the one we're looking at here, is fun to work out with. Now, it's not super heavy, but you grab it by one end and go through some motions, kind of like an Indian club, and it does the job. And that thick, polished wood, I have to say, feels so much more satisfying in the hand than, say, metal. Here, by the way, is the website Facebook page of the maker. Johnson's Wood of the Morning. I think there's a little pun in there. It was actually two years ago I bought this thing, so every year since then it's been like I see them at Scarborough Fair when it comes to the uh, North Texas area. It's like, hey, I really am going to make a video about it, so now I have. I'll do a second video on malls from a martial arts and actual practical use perspective. As I said, they really are interesting and fairly unique from a martial arts perspective. You know, a lot of top-heavy impact weapons almost all of them are going to be one-handed. And they're not going to have the large blockish head that a maul has. I, I probably need to get a hold of one with a much bigger head than this for more experimenting, like that Japanese one that I showed earlier in the video. But here's my kind of convenience size version, and it will do for now. It's a fun little toy. Mauls, a forgotten impact weapon. Thank you.